this demonstration, we're going to be using the uh, Andromeda Research Labs Automotive Locksmith Kit Number One to uh, reflash a uh, Toyota ECU-based immobilizer. This is from a 2001 Camry with a six-cylinder engine. And uh, let's just begin by opening the um, the ECU and uh, identifying the part. Uh, we've already taken the, most of the screws out, except two that hold the back cover on to save time. So we'll take those out and then proceed to access the circuit assembly, which is inside. Normally there would be two screws here and here, which is holding the circuit assembly, and those are have been removed. So we're going to lift this out, set the case aside, and flip this over. And from this uh, position you can uh, identify the, the three processors which uh, do the primary control of the engine and the mobilization function and perhaps climate control and other things that this module does. But we're going to focus on one 8-pin uh, EEPROM and that's uh, a 93C56 part and it's located, let me rotate this so uh, hopefully you can see the, the part. Uh, it's IC900. Whenever you have a, uh, an ECU-based immobilizing system, uh, the, the IC is going to be IC900, and it's in almost all cases, there's one case where it's not, but in almost all cases it's a 93C56, and in the case where it's not, I don't believe it's IC900, but that's covered uh, in the uh, locksmith librarian, which I'll show you in a, a moment. So anyway, the, the part to which we're going to attach is right here. That's the 8-pin uh, double EEPROM. And I'll zoom in so we can see the, the part number. I think you should be able to read that. Anyway, it says 93C56. So that's the part to which we are going to attach, and we're going to uh, use the uh, AR32A programming unit um, with the EEPROM Plus uh, software to uh, do the reflash operation. So I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to uh, show you the AR32A programming unit and we'll power it up and just give you a, a quick overview of, of how that works. Okay, this is the AR32A programming unit. It's not powered on. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. We have three LEDs here which indicate uh, uh, whether or not the system has power. Uh, the yellow one is socket power, which is going to be on whenever the system is performing an operation on the part. A programming, which is normally on for programming, but not in all cases. So let's connect the power. We use an external power pack with the system, primarily because if you uh, power, if you're, if you're not aware of how much current the assembly with which you're working draws, uh, it's many times a, a USB based uh, programmer um, which draws its power from the USB power source in the computer is relying on the power source in the computer to not just power the programmer but also power the entire assembly, uh, especially if you're, if you're doing insert work. If you're doing out of circuit work it doesn't make any difference. You can drop the chip and whatever programmer you have and, and you'll be successful. But the Andromeda Research Package is designed for insert work because unsoldering is something that a lot of people do not want to do. So uh, we specifically use an external power pack which gives us plenty of power for the drivers and the, the module to uh, allow you to be successful with uh, almost all insert work. We have a really, really good uh, record of uh, performing uh, in-circuit reading and programming of all the different families of parts and a variety of modules, not just uh, uh, immobilizers, but ECUs and body controller modules and airbags and uh, things like that. Um, what we have done in this case, normally the connecting cable routes out of the side of the, the programmer here, but in this case to keep the demonstration area clean, we have it uh, routed out the back. Um, and also this white paper that is in the lid is something that we provide it's, it's instructions for using the kit. Uh, you, it's, it's, we don't put it in the lid, we give it to you optionally, and you can cut it out and put it in the lid if you choose to do that. 
So let's go ahead and proceed. Uh, we've applied power. The green power LED is now on. So let's switch over to the computer and we'll start the software. All right, we're running this on a, a Panasonic Toughbook CF31 with Windows 7. So uh, it's not that we don't, it's perfectly compatible with Windows 10. It's just that Windows 7 is a little bit cleaner interface and uh, we already had it installed on this machine. So over here is the uh, desktop icon. It says EEPROM Plus Programming System. Whenever you invoke our any of our, our, our kits, whether it's a uh, an automotive locksmith kit, an automotive kit, which is specifically for automotive technicians, if you're doing copy machines or even video games or industrial controls, whatever, the EEPROM Plus system is a, a, a deep history extended service instrument. It uh, will go back and do uh, the early EEPROMs from when Jimmy Carter was president. That's not of interest to automotive locksmiths, but it is for folks who have to maintain uh, older equipment. So we'll double click the uh, icon and it'll find the unit, start the software, and the first thing that you see is the device selection table. Okay, the system supports, as I said, a wide variety of components. Um, what you are going to be working with, primarily at least for this reflash demonstration, is the serial double EEPROMs. So the first page is regular EEPROMs from the, the late 1970s, 80s, 90s, and then, but we're going to page down to serial double EEPROMs. I'm not going to go through each one of these categories of components that we support. Here we get into the 24 series of, of EEPROMs, uh, the 25 series, and here we are to 93 and 95 series. Okay, now the way that this works, if you want to do this, um, you can use the arrow keys and you can move down until you find your part. And some, something that I'll point out that we've done is we use what are called core part numbers. And a core part number is a number that if you're fortunate enough to have a chip that's big enough to have it printed on it, it will basically represent that, that component. It represents what the part number is of that component. But chips today, many of the devices today, are so small that you don't have any idea who made it. So a lot of times also it'll have a, a fragment of a part number printed on it. So what we've done over the years that we have uh, been supporting our, our product is we have uh, collected all of those part numbers, part number fragments and things like that and uh, put them into our device, uh, device support list. And we don't ask you to figure out whether it's a Fairchild, whether it's a microchip, whether it's you know uh, Fujitsu, whoever made the part. Just look at the core part number or the part number fragment and key it in. Okay, there's two ways to, to select uh, the, the, the part with which you're working. And we don't let you proceed until we know which part you're working with. And the reason we do that is that if you select a, an EEPROM from the late 1970s or early 1980s, those use high voltage in their, their programming and, and even in their standard operation. And if you pick that part and you have it connected to a regular 8-pin part, uh, you can configure it and it's possible to damage the part. So we don't let you move forward and the, the, the programming unit is uh, in a benign state when it, when it powers on until we know which part you're working with. Okay, so one way to, to determine the, the part that you're working with is to find it on the screen, meaning you have to use your eyeballs and hunt through all those different part numbers. And then if you uh, look down at the lower right hand corner, it says INS select from screen. Okay, so if I press the INS key, which is the insert key, I'm going to pick the 93C56. Okay, and when we, once you do that, there it is in the upper left-hand corner of this screen. You'll see the part number, and it, it, uh, that part number has been chosen. Now, I'm going to, re, I'm going to uh, have the screen reappear, but I want to show you the, a better way to, or a faster way for you to, to, to uh, select your part. Basically, when the system starts, it will give you the uh, device selection table. As a matter of fact, let's just start the system again so you can see it. This is the easiest way to do it. Many people don't know this is possible. So I want you to understand it. Um, right here where it says enter device type, that's where you type the part number. Well, you can just type 93C56. Let the system search the list for you. Boom. 
So you don't have to go to page down through all the categories unless you're curious about whether or not a part number exists. It's easier to just let the system uh, look for you. And um, as I said, we use core part numbers. So when you when you find a core part number, um, you just type it in and press enter. Okay, the next thing that happens on the screen in the lower uh, the lower area there, about the lower one one fourth on the left hand side, you'll see it says programming unit switch. Okay, the, we use a, a dip switch to configure the programming unit because one, they are uh, very reliable, and two, uh, it just allows us to uh, uh, support parts that other programmers don't support because of the length of time that uh, we have been. Uh, programming memory parts and the, the dip switch is something it's 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 simple it's easy and it works so for the 93c56 and actually this holds true for all of the 8 pin AA problems the dip switch will never change from the switch settings that are shown here uh, it's 2 3 and 5 up and the rest are down and also on the right hand side we tell you which adapter is required and I'll cover that in a moment but right now let's go back to the programming unit and We'll zoom in so you can see the dip switch. And I'm going to set 2, 3, and 5 so that they're up. And now the dip switch is configured. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is, uh, as before, the computer display software says requires adapter ASER SM1A or ASER EE2. Okay, the ASER SM1A is our current in-circuit adapter with the variable voltages which allow for the successful in-circuit work. The ASER EE2 is an older uh, zero double EEPROM adapter which only supported dip components and it only worked at 5 volts. So that's not uh, suggested for in-circuit work. You can get away with it in some cases, but in most cases, it's it's better to use the end circuit adapter. And if you look down at below, at the very bottom, it tells you plug or device position left. All right. Well, let's switch over back to the uh, programming unit. We'll install the adapter, and also notice it says 93XX. Okay, that's the family of double E prom with which you will be working. So we go back to the programming unit. This is the uh, in-circuit adapter. You'll notice that it also has a dip switch here when we tell you how those are set. For this particular family apart, the 93XX family, uh, all of those are down, which is shown on the diagram. And then we have three headers, the 93 family, the 2595 family, and the 24 family. Okay, that's the microwire, the SPI bus, and the I squared C bus. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, it's I squared C, it's not I two C, and uh, we'll do a training video on why that is. These two switches are what allow it, our in circuit success rate to be so high. I'm going to explain quickly how these work and why you you choose them. Okay, the switch on the right here has two settings. It has the LV setting on the left and plus five on the right. Okay. If it's in the plus 5 position, 5 volts will always be applied to your part. If it's in the LV position, then the LV range switch becomes active and you have three choices. You have 3 volts, 3.6 volts, and 4.2 volts. We found after many many years of uh, experience with the different families of devices with in-circuit work, these voltages are give you the best option depending upon the family. Okay. The other thing that we found is normally, uh, this is a guideline, um, 3.6 volts works well for the 93 family apart. Um, it's just one of those things. Whenever you're doing in-circuit work, it's kind of a science experiment because you don't know anything about the circuitry to which your memory part is connected. You don't know whether or not that circuitry is going to interfere. You don't know whether or not the processor is going to run. Um, you don't know who made your 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 device, um, so it, this is where we suggest you start. Um, but you can set it to any of, of the other voltages, including five, if you would want to, to uh, make that attempt at, at in circuit programming. 
But the module electronics is designed to run at 5 volts. So what you need to understand is that if you set it to 5 volts, the opportunity for the, the little computer, the processor, on the module itself to become active. And if that happens, then it's possible that it'll try to access the memory part at the same time we do, and you'll get data collision. You can possibly corrupt your part. Um, so we suggest that you uh, always start in the LV setting, uh, in the uh, setting the, the range switch for a uh, either the low, the low voltage 3.6 or 4.2. Okay, now let's install the adapter into the programming unit. We're going to lift the, the handle on the zip socket. We're going to put it in and make sure it's all the way to the left. The reason that we have to insert it all the way to the left is that this adapter will work with our previous version of uh, a programming unit, the Air 28, which is it's been discontinued. It's it's been around. It was around for uh, many years. It only programmed uh, EEPROMs. Uh, they're still out there. You can find them on uh, the market every now and then. But the adapter will go into the Air 28, which has a 28 pin socket, not a 32 pin socket, and that's why this adapter has to be inserted all the way to the left, so it aligns properly with the pins on the on the zip socket. Okay, now we got the adapter installed. We have the the voltage settings. We have the uh, the configuration switch on the programming unit set. We're going to be using the, the blue clip to uh, attach to our um, immobilizer part in the ECU. This is the, uh, the Pomona clip. Um, you'll notice that we provide a, a red dot on the clip here. The red dot indicates pin 1 of the part. And, um, I'll tell you how to identify pin 1 on, on this particular part and on any other 8-pin double EEPROM part. Um, they always mark pin 1. You will never find a manufacturer that doesn't mark pin 1 on the part. Uh, sometimes people will tell me that um, I can't find pin 1, it doesn't have pin 1. And uh, I will explain how just look for you know two, two specific situations and you'll be able to locate it. But anyway, so we're going to attach the, uh, the Pomona clip to the in-circuit adapter, all of our connection options, whether it's the clip or the probes, the probe set, the AccuTouch probe, the precision probe, the surface mount probes, the dip clip, all terminate with the black plug. That means you can use any of our connection options on any of the, uh, the adapters that we sell. So that means you can use the, the surface mount probe set on an ACOM means you can use the dip clip on the end circuit adapter. So um, by having that be a standard, you can uh, connect any of our connection options to any of our adapters. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is we use a, a ribbon cable, a colored cable, and the reason we use a colored cable is because the, the Electronic Industry Association, EIA, has a standard color code where the colors represent numbers. Okay, the, the colors go from black to white, where black is zero, uh, brown is one, red is two, orange is three, yellow is four, up through white, which is nine, but we only have eight here, which is brown through gray, and that goes one through eight. And the reason that we use one through eight is because it aligns with the pin numbers on an eight pin part, meaning that the brown wire would be connected to pin number one, the red wire would be connected to pin number two, orange wire to pin number three, etc. Okay, so if you're hooking up to one of the little teeny weeny, uh, like a TSSOP um, EEPROM, and you're using the Precision Probe Set, the Precision Probe Set will have colored probes. And the colored probes are colored brown through gray. So you then would connect the Precision Probes to um, the appropriate pins on the, on the double EEPROM. The other thing is the brown wire, because these, co these connectors are not keyed, um, you have to orient, when you put the plug on, you have to orient the brown wire so that pin, the brown wire matches aligns with pin 1 on the connector. Now we have labeled these where it says brown pin 1, brown pin 1, brown pin 1. Pin 1 is marked, it's on the right, so when you put the plug on the, the appropriate connector, in this case it's the 93XX, you just put it over the top of the part and you push down. And now it's, it's connected and we're ready to uh, attach the, the clip to the memory part on the uh, immobilizer. 
So let me get the immobilizer back and we'll get the clip attached. Okay, the immobilizer is in position. And let me uh, zoom in so we have a little bit better picture of where we're going to attach the clip. Once again, Here is the part, right here, there, and the clip is going to be put over the top of the part. Okay, I have the clip attached to the part, and now at this point we're going to uh, hit the space bar here on the, oops. to return to the command list and let me just tell you quickly how our software works and why it works the way that it works because there are people that say why isn't this a Windows program and the answer is really simple this product will run without Windows you can run it off of the distribution CD you can make a bootable USB drive you can run on any computer that was manufactured in the last 40 years you can even run it on a dead machine with no hard drive as long as the processor is working and the machine is compatible with the interface you'll be able to make this system work um, we, we designed the AR system, we designed it to last for as many years as possible and for people that work on uh, especially older equipment uh, they certainly appreciate the fact that they don't have to uh, have the latest of this or that for Microsoft or the latest you know, service pack uh, whatever the latest update is or the latest whatever um, our product will work in almost all circumstances it's the way it was designed and since that's the case, it doesn't support a mouse, all right? Because there's no, uh, there's no way for, for example, a machine without a hard drive and an operating system and drivers and all of the other pieces that would go with that to work. So we use the keyboard. And if you, if you, once you understand how that works, you'll find it's really fast. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you a, a feature of the software called the um, uh, librarian, and the librarian is, is used to, uh, it, it works for airbags, it works for the locksmith uh, community. Uh, it's a general purpose uh, feature which can be customized for different applications. Okay, And the way that you access the librarian is by using the path command. Okay, The path merely sets uh, where you're working. It, it'll set uh, a, a directory on your hard drive or you can set it to point to a uh, flash drive that's plugged into your computer if you want to save things to a flash drive. Um, and you access it by pressing the P key. So I'm going to press P. And it says directory uh, in, directories in root. Okay, that's the basic level on this particular hard drive in this machine. But I want to work in the locksmith directory or the locksmith folder, whatever, whichever term you prefer. Microsoft likes to call them folders. So we'll say folder. And there I have highlighted locksmith. I'm using the arrow keys to move around here. And that's how you do it. You just go highlight locksmith and then you press enter and that will select locksmith and it'll take you back to the main command list. And now I want to invoke the librarian for locksmith in the locksmith uh, directory. So I'll press L for system librarian. Okay, this is the librarian of locksmith. These are all uh, entries within the locksmith uh, that people in the locksmith community would find helpful. There's information here, there's the Chrysler pin converters, there's the, the doing a Toyota Delta, Saab, Pacifica, I mean all of these. You can go through them at your, at your leisure, but we're going to do a Toyota reflash now. But let me just show you quickly how the librarian works. Okay, use the arrow keys and you move around in the upper pane and you'll notice as I move, the information changes in the lower pane. Okay, there's the Chrysler pin conversion. Um, so, as you move around in the, in the um, upper pane of the librarian, the lower pane reflects information, which tells you how to do what you're going to do, what you choose to do. So, in this case, we're going to go to Toyota, and you'll see, I'll just read quickly what it says, after clipper probes are attached to... Uh, the, the chip, which in this case is the 93C86, press tab, or you can also press enter. 
then use the arrow keys to move cursor to the desired line, to the line of the desired vehicle. Then you press F6, press F3, and then press P, and you'll reflash your part. Okay, so there are your instructions. Just do what the instructions say. So I'm going to press the tab key. You can also press enter, but I'll press tab, which are the double arrows on the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And you'll notice that the center line, which is called the status line, changes to the mode, changes to view. Okay, and you'll notice that there's a cursor that's now blinking on the... Uh, in the lower pane. All right, that's your selector. So we're going to use the arrow keys and we're going to move the cursor down. And remember, you could be running this out of window, outside of Windows on another machine. It would work exactly the same way. So you're not put in a position where you uh, would not be able to function. Even if your computer quit, you could just boot off the, in this case, you could boot off the CD and, and make it work. So the instrument allows you to, to run in, on almost any platform. Okay, the uh, ECU is Camry. Camry Solaire is, is one uh, of the selections here. So we're going to put the cursor on the, the Camry Solaire line. And you'll notice there's the, the, the model of the vehicle, the year, standard uh, XLE. And then following that is information that the librarian will use and the first entry, and this is all automatic for you, okay, is the file name. So you don't have to worry about which file to use. This is 32bit.cde. CDE stands for code. It's just the name of the file. And then there's the device number. Now, why do we include the device number? Because if you choose the wrong device, let's say that you had incorrectly chosen 93C66. When you get to this point in the librarian and you press the F6 key, the system will correctly identify the part and change to the correct part number for you. So you, if you've messed up, we will unmess the mess and allow you to uh, proceed uh, successfully to, uh, to programming your part. The next thing we tell you is the location of the, the ECU, in which case this one is behind the glove box, and the silkscreen identifier, which is IC900. Okay, so uh, those are things that I, I covered earlier. So now we're gonna go ahead and perform the reflash. Okay, so uh, remember what the instruction said, press F6. Now watch what happens when I press F6. This is the F6 key. The status line changes. Mode is now program or load. Okay, we're going to program. If you wanted to just load the data from that file into the buffer, you could do that. The file is going to be loaded is 32bit.cde. That's the file name. And then on the right, it says F3 to program or F4 to load. So we're going to go ahead and program. So we're going to have F hit press F3. And you'll notice that we now leave the librarian and we have uh, invoked the program device from disk file command, which is you have to do nothing other than uh, look what it says in the lower pane, program or skip. And it, on the right it says number of devices required one, insert device number one, device starting address zero, which is just where in the buffer it starts. And all you have to do is press P to program. So let's program it. Programming complete, data verification is correct. What that means is this, uh, the file, the virgin, the virgin file has now been programmed into the immobilizer uh, EEPROM and you are ready to reinstall this ECU back into the vehicle. Uh, go through the learn procedure and uh, introduce new keys. Now let me show you something else before we uh, we end this um, this demo. We also have in the librarian, go back to the librarian, a couple of entries which you may find helpful. One is called before you start, which is right here, and it's before you start, and it's how to confirm that the uh, clip or probes are properly connected to a part. And again, if you press tab, you go into view mode because there's more information than what is at the on the first part of this and you can scroll down and it tells you to clean the part and attach the clip and uh, other things that it, you may find helpful confirming valid data etc um, then there's one after you have reflashed your immobilizer okay there are two kinds of immobilizers uh, this is an ECU based immobilizer but there are the little black box immobilizers when Toyota and Lexus moved the uh, 
the immobilization function out of the ECU and into a separate module. So the reflashing procedure is different, or the procedure is different. So <clears throat> we have an entry called You Are Done, and You Are Done explains to you uh, the different procedures for the ECU-based immobilizers and the black box immobilizers, how to introduce keys, how to, uh, what the security light will do, uh, how to close the programming cycle, that's all here. So that information is available to you. Um, because you, we understand that locksmiths work on a whole lot of different cars. And sometimes you get a Toyota and sometimes you, you know, get a, a Chrysler. Well, obviously the Chrysler's procedure is going to be different than Toyota. So we give you the information here, which allows you to uh, perform the operation based on the vehicle to which, you know, you're, on which you're working. So one more thing I want to show you before we uh, wrap this up, and that is if you were doing a Lexus, you would um, get out of the view mode and you would go over to uh, Lexus. And Lexus is the same as the Toyota, except it has Lexus vehicles and models. Oops. And again, you scroll down, then depending upon the, whether it's ES300 or GS or GX or IS or what, whichever one it is in the year, and um, the appropriate reflash files are there. And it works the same way, where you just highlight it and press F6, then F3 and P, and F you connect to it. So that's why uh, you can do a Lexus or a Toyota, since basically it's the, the same company. So um, that pretty much um, wraps up this demonstration. So one more thing that I would like to say is that uh, one of the things about our business is that um, our products are manufactured in the USA and uh, we are always happy to help you. And if you choose to purchase our product um, and have any issues, you can call us and we'll talk to you on the phone. Unlike many uh, companies where it has an, have an email address only or they're in a different part of the world, um, we're here to help. So uh, given that, if um, you would like to uh, uh, perhaps acquire one of our products or one of the options that we have available, um, you can do that. Uh, and, uh, any information that, uh, that we provide is uh, available uh, on our website. And the website is arlabs.com. Thank you very much for watching.